All right, you guys, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips, and we're going to keep talking about this book, Whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition. I sure hope I've motivated you to read it and motivated you to come here this fall to hear Dr. Campbell talk about the book. I am really looking forward to that myself, because I'm sure he'll go even beyond what's in the book. He always does. So we left off, we've been talking about reductionism all the way through these, um, these video clips, and we were talking about supplements and why supplements don't really work. It's the reductionist theory of take a nutrient out, have a magical effect on health, and um, it'll be the same as if you ate the apple or the quinoa or whatever it is you pulled the nutrient from, and the fact that these supplements can actually cause harm. So he uses some examples. Vitamin E is one of them. In 1993, a study reported an association, this is an important term here, between higher blood levels of vitamin E and lower risk of major coronary disease. Now the study measured vitamin E from foods, not supplements, and the study only showed correlation and did not identify any cause and effect relationship. But and this is part of the problem is the way information is reported. The researchers reported that, quote, vitamin E supplementation may reduce the risk of coronary artery disease, end of quote. May. Notice it didn't say does. It says may. Follow-up studies, though, show that vitamin E supplements do not reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease or cancer or diabetes, cataracts, or chronic obstructive lung disease. And a meta-analysis of several dozen studies involving over 300,000 subjects showed that taking vitamin E, beta-carotene, and vitamin A increases mortality. Okay, omega-3 fatty acids are also very popular. But an analysis of 89 studies concluded that taking omega-3 fatty acids, quote, does not have a clear effect on total mortality, combined cardiovascular events, or cancer." End of quote. Another study that included over 200,000 people followed for 15 years concluded that taking omega-3 supplements increased the risk of type 2 diabetes and that the higher the dose, the higher the incidence of diabetes. Campbell talks about beta-carotene, citing a study showing that smokers taking beta-carotene supplements had a 46% increased risk of developing lung cancer and a 26% increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. But beta-carotene intake from food is associated with lower lung cancer risk. Again, thinking back to the Tuesday broadcast when we talked about the very complex interaction between nutrients and with nutrients in food. Well, none of this evidence has convinced the supplement industry, of course. They have a vested interest. They continue to insist that the studies are flawed and to point out that taking certain supplements changes biomarkers like cholesterol and blood sugar. None of us dispute that, but Campbell reminds us that changed biomarkers are not proxies for improved health. But the reason we use these surrogate markers, as they're called, is that it's easier and cheaper to look at the effects of drugs and supplements on blood cholesterol or blood sugar levels than it is to measure longer term health outcomes, and that's really what's important to almost everybody. Campbell devotes a chapter to reductionist social policy, which includes the effect of all of these practices we've been discussing and the healthcare system on the environment, global warming, the quality and quantity of our water supply, deforestation, world hunger, and animal welfare. And I won't go into detail here, um, but I think you've heard a lot about this before, both at our conferences and in the books that I write. They're just all powerful reasons to adopt a plant-based diet because as it turns out, the decisions we make about what we eat and how we take care of ourselves don't just affect us, they affect everybody around us and in fact the entire planet. The third section of the book is about the powerful vested interests that perpetuate the reductionist approach to health. He, Campbell started his career thinking that science was a search for the truth, and it actually should be. I don't think it's what it is anymore. Government and business interests often keep the public from knowing the truth. Campbell says that he doesn't believe that there's some vast evil conspiracy that keeps the public from finding out the truth about things, and that there are a lot of people who believe that what they're doing is right. You know, there are scientists who are confused, journalists who don't understand what they're reporting, and a lot of people working in institutions who think that they're doing the right thing. The problem is the system. The system is broken. The whole research organization of uh, the way we look at things in this country is broken. The people are just a byproduct of the broken system. Campbell describes the healthcare system as everything that impacts our health, and that starts with agricultural policies, it includes school lunch programs, funding for research, and of course, doctors, hospitals, and drug and device makers. 
He proposes a new system, and this would be so exciting if only it could happen, in which the primary factor that we look for is information, and this would result from scientific inquiry. And if this were done with collaboration and competition among scientists, competition for the truth, not to come out with new products or to suppress ideas, but actual competition among scientists, eventually the weight of the evidence would lead to studies designed to test theories on health outcomes. The media, professional trade journals, and government would all promote these findings and public policy would result. Industry would respond by creating products that promote health since those things would sell better. But it's not the way our system works and it most likely will never work this way. And that's why books like this and the type of work that we do here at the Wellness Forum becomes so important because it's highly unlikely that the system is going to change. We're just going to have to, uh, well, it won't change because of some type of top-down initiative. It's going to be, be because people make different decisions. Due to the profit motive, even the types of studies that are conducted are driven by the potential for products and increased sales rather than finding the truth. For example, studies are conducted to find out how to put nutrients in pills rather than finding out how to get people to eat the right diet. Reductionist research looks at individual nutrients in drugs and the results are then fed to the media, which is owned by industry and funded by industry advertising, and government and private think tanks that develop public policy. Industry creates new products and then lobbies the government to make them the standard of care. Press releases are sent to the media emphasizing the evidence supporting the use of their products. And so the whole system is set up to perpetuate this reductionist approach. Um, I promise you by the end of this, it won't seem hopeless. I get asked sometimes, you know, do you ever feel like it's just such a hopeless cause that we can't change this? Gosh, if I felt like that, I wouldn't do this every week, but I don't think that. I think it's just an education issue directed at the general public, a groundswell of activity that will eventually shift things. I just don't have faith in our government to fix the problem. But Campbell has an optimistic end to this whole story too, which I'll share with you when we get to that point. All right, that's it for now. So have a wonderful day and weekend. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might be interested in watching it, and I will be back to you again next Tuesday.